during week 203 of Brad's Branded Thoughts. Did Kirk Ferentz make a huge mistake not looking for a quarterback in the transfer portal this past offseason? We'll run through the stats of all the top transfers at that position that are playing at their respective schools. Compare them to Iowa's quarterback room through two weeks. Plus, an exclusive sit down with Iowa basketball guard Tony Perkins. He talks about his outlook on the 22-23 season and where he sees the biggest jump in his game. All that and more during week 203 of Brad is Branded Thoughts. This is from the Hawkeye of the Storm. Hawkeye fans, let's talk about health and performance optimization for a moment. Our sponsor, Ascent Nutrition, offers amazing products. It's actually owned by former Iowa graduate Lance Shuttler. Now, I've decided to partner with Ascent Nutrition because of their unique approach to human health. Ascent offers an organically grown mold and mycotoxin-free coffee. It provides a pure, clean, and rich flavor without those pesticides that most coffees are treated with. They also offer an algae oil DHA, which is used to support brain health, memory, and focus, as well as proper nervous system development in adults, children, athletes, and even pets. Now, lastly, their unique crafted wild pine pollen is used to support cardiovascular health, hormonal function, and a healthy libido. Your purchase not only supports this channel, but the business of a former Hawkeye. Visit GoAscentNutrition.com or click the link in the description below and use the code Hawkeyes. That's the code Hawkeyes to receive 15% off your total order from Ascent Nutrition. Week number 203 of Brada's Branded Thoughts. Hear it from the Hawkeye of the Storm. And I I cannot believe that uh, week 202 was a season preview with Coach Don Patterson. And here we are doing week 203, just two weeks after the initial uh, uh, season preview with Coach Patterson. And uh, it feels like this season has uh, turned south already. It's clear there are huge issues right now on offense. I'm not here to belabor the point. I literally did a a three-and-a-half-hour postgame show on Saturday after the game, if you're not watching the post game shows with myself and Coach Patterson and you, the caller, please do so. Turn notifications on so you know when we're going live. And you can, of course, listen to it via your fa- favorite podcast platform by searching from the Hawkeye of the Storm. You can watch it back here on YouTube. But look, I I, I feel bad for Spencer Petrus to some extent. I believe the coaches when they talk about uh, Spencer Petrus being a class act individual, um, being a great leader. Being a nice kid, you can tell he's a nice human being. He's obviously generous. He gave thousands of dollars to uh, Tory Taylor's foundation here or his charity before the season started. Like nothing about uh, this criticism or uh, I don't think anybody, really anybody in their right mind, there's nobody in their right mind criticizing Spencer as a human being. But it's clear that he uh, struggles when the lights come on. The fundamentals that you would think would transfer from practice to uh, the playing field, that just that transfer is not occurring. And it is a fact that some guys shrink when the lights turn on. Some guys rise to the occasion. And I think I speak for a lot of fans that are frustrated by the fact that Iowa refuses, or at least up until now, they have refused to look to a guy like Joey Labus, to look to a guy like Alex Padilla, even though we saw Alex last year. Remember, there were a lot of drops um, during those uh, Alex Padilla quarterback games. Uh, And fans are frustrated that I was not willing to see what those guys can give you right now, Spencer Petrus, I'm going to throw these numbers up and, and I didn't even uh, want to say Spencer Petrus per se, but, but he represents the entire quarterback room because that's who I was putting out on the field on Saturdays through two weeks. So I, I mean, it is what it is, but this is Iowa's quarterback room through two games, a 45% completion percentage for Spencer Petrus. That is really, really, really bad. Now keep in mind, Both games were at home, one against an FCS opponent, albeit a good FCS opponent, but an FCS opponent nonetheless, and an average Iowa State defense. 201 total yards, uh, passing yards, I should say, through two games. That's not factoring in sacks. Let's not even look at those numbers. Uh, 201 total yards for Spencer Peters through the air. No touchdowns, two interceptions. His passer rating is 70. Um, Not the same as QBR. Those are measured differently, especially, you know, depending on what – um, database you're looking at, but a 70 passer rating is not good at all. All right, you can compare them to some of these quarterbacks that we're going to run through here in a second. But it's clear that this the quarterback position is a, a total mess right now, and it's not just about Spencer Petrus. It's about development. The fact that Iowa doesn't have confidence in Joey Labus, 
uh, or Alex Padilla um, to a point where they're going to continue to throw Spencer Petras to the Wolves. I think that speaks volumes about the lack of production, lack of development that, that Brian Ferentz has been a part of. And honestly, what are we getting out of John Budmeyer right now? Paying the guy $4,000 a week to do what? 4000 a week he's getting because he's an analyst. He's an offensive analyst and a QB guru. Where are the results? Spencer Petras repeatedly throwing uh, to Sam Laporta and Arlen Bruce over their heads um, repeatedly, consistently. Um, simple out routes. Uh, he has problems completing. It's just a train wreck right now. Iowa, the 131st ranked offense in the FBS. And guess how many teams there are on the FBS? 131. Uh, this is a uh, this Iowa offense has an opportunity to be historically one of the worst offenses to ever uh, compete at the FBS level. That is a uh, th- that's a startling, mind boggling fact, but it is a fact. You look at the total offense for Iowa right now in the FBS. There is a big gap between 131 and 130. Like I was not even close to being second worst in the country. Now, did Iowa lose an opportunity? in the transfer portal during the offseason. If you watch any of my stuff, you know I feel very strongly about Iowa and the fact that they should have went, and my belief that they should have went to the transfer portal at quarterback. Nothing personal against any of them. Not Spencer Petras, not Alex Padilla. Iowa refused to do so during an offseason in which there were more quarterbacks available, more proven quarterbacks available than ever before. And I don't want to hear the narrative of, well, the only guys going to the portal are guys who lost their jobs. That's actually not always the case. There are coaching changes. All right, we saw a lot of that. Obviously, you think of the Dylan Gabriel move. He goes to Oklahoma. Caleb Williams wanted to play for Lincoln Riley at USC. Those are just a couple of examples. The fact of the matter is that is a sad, sorry excuse. And if I'm Iowa right now, I I am kicking myself that uh, they didn't make a hard push for a transfer portal quarterback. I did see one media member, one Iowa media member, comment on Twitter a couple of weeks ago or a week ago or so basically implying that Iowa did contact a couple quarterbacks, uh, but very vague, very cryptic tweet and no response as far as who those quarterbacks are. So until I can get firm evidence that Iowa did that, I'm not, I'm, I don't believe any of that. I think that would have come out in the public. And if I'm wrong, I'll, I'll eat those words, but I'd like to know who those quarterbacks would have been that Iowa allegedly went after. So what we're going to do here during the next few minutes, and we will get to um, Iowa guard Tony Perkins. He'll be coming up on the show here shortly. But uh, before we get to Tony's interview, I want to talk about the top transfer portal quarterbacks. In fact, I've got a list of the top 18. We're not going to run through every one of them, but we'll go through about 15 or so quickly, rapid fire. Now, keep in mind the numbers that I just showed you from Iowa's quarterback room, like it or not, it's Spencer Petrus, but Spencer's not the one starting himself. The, The coaches are the guys putting him out there. And so these are the numbers we have to go off of. So let's look at, let's compare Petrus's numbers, first of all, to Caleb Williams, who I think most people would uh, would venture to say was the top-rated transfer portal quarterback during this past offseason. And I'm also going to tell you who these teams have played, who these quarterbacks have matched up against, because that's a factor as well. But again, Iowa has not played murderer's row through two weeks. Caleb Williams, and we mentioned him, Oklahoma to USC. The Trojans have played Rice and Stanford. Caleb Williams' stats so far, 80% through the year, 590 yards with a 221 passer rating. 221. Dylan Gabriel, he goes from Central Florida to OU, 71% through the year with 529 yards and a 190 passer rating. They played... uh, El Paso and Kent State. So not murderers row for the Sooners either. Spencer Rattler, he goes from Oklahoma to South Carolina. Another example of a, a change, I think partly because of uh, the coaching situation there and, and a bit of a fallout, I think, with uh, maybe with, with Rattler and Lincoln Riley. Rattler at South Carolina so far, they played Georgia State and a very good Arkansas team. Rattler's thrown for 62% through the air, 603 yards and a 129 passer rating. JT Daniels, the former Georgia Bulldog, now a Mountaineer. West Virginia has played two Power 5 teams, Pittsburgh and Kansas. He's thrown for 64% through the air, 569 yards, and a 139 passer rating. Quinn Ewers, the uh, Ohio State transfer, he is at Texas now, got hurt against Alabama. They have played the Crimson Tide and University of Louisiana Monroe, but Ewers, when he played, 69% through the air, 
359 yards and a 166 passer rating. Cameron Ward, he goes from Incarnate Word to uh, the FCS program, Incarnate Word, who, by the way, just beat Nevada this past week without Cameron Ward. He goes from Incarnate Word to Wazoo. They have played Idaho and Wisconsin. They upset the Badgers this past weekend. Cameron Ward's numbers 62% through the year, 423 passing yards, and a 128 passer rating. Bo Nix, disastrous performance week one against a really good Georgia team. He goes from Auburn to Oregon, and his first game, again, was uh, very forgetful. Uh, But listen to these numbers. Not too bad for Bo Nix. 70% through two games, 450 yards, and a 142 passer rating in eastern washington no slouch of an fcs program casey thompson the uh, texas to nebraska transfer they of course have played three games with scott frost now done northwestern north dakota and georgia southern they've lost two of those three but casey thompson has been very productive 64 percent through the year 866 yards and a 146 passer rating their issues defense and coaching folks it's not casey thompson keaton slovis another trojan transfer to pittsburgh uh, he is uh, he has played West Virginia and Tennessee. How about a start? What a what a start for Keaton Slovis' career! And listen to these numbers: sixty three percent through the year, five hundred three yards, and a one sixty passer rating. How about Jaden Daniels, the Arizona State transfer, heads to LSU, the marathon of a game against the Seminoles, seventy eight percent through the year, three hundred forty six yards, and a one seventy nine passer rating. Jackson Dart. From USC to Ole Miss during the offseason, 67% so far through two games. They've played Troy and Central Arkansas. Again, not murderers row. He's also thrown for 336 yards and a 158 passer rating. How about Jaden Delora, a guy that I was pining for as well, the Washington State transfer. His numbers don't look great. Far better than what Iowa has produced, though. 56% through the air, 519 yards, a 121 passer rating for a very poor program in Arizona. you telling me that Iowa couldn't have wrestled Jaden Delora away from Arizona? Give me a break. Michael Penix, the Indiana transfer who got hurt last year, but uh, very productive 2020. He goes from Indiana to Washington. He's played Kent State and Portland State. He's thrown for 70%, 682 yards, and a 184 passer rating. Connor Bazelak, former Iowa target in uh, there, I believe that was their 2019 um, 2019 recruiting cycle, I believe. Don't quote me. Uh, the Mizzou to Indiana transfer. He's thrown for just 54% through the year. Actually played really well against Illinois, I thought. Uh, 527 yards through the air and a 116 passer rating. So not great numbers, but again, nothing even comparable to what Iowa is doing right now at that position. Not even close. Gary Bohannon, the Baylor transfer. He goes to South Florida so far. They've played Howard and a very good BYU team. Bohannon, who's playing at a group of five school, 59% through the air, 391 yards and a 108 passer rating. And I'm not even giving you the rushing numbers because guys like Gary Bohannon and guys like, you know, Casey Thompson, Bo Nix, those guys can move. And boy, imagine Iowa with those passing numbers plus a guy who who's a threat to run. It changes everything. So again, you can see the numbers below. Not trying to just rub it in that I was right. I wish I was wrong. I wish that Iowa had made a decision that proved me wrong and that this offense is now a factor or at least average or slightly below average. Instead, they've went from bad to worse and we're here watching the 131st ranked offense in all of the FBS. So, what's the solution moving forward? Look, you gotta, you, you gotta make a change at quarterback. I've been saying this for weeks now. Um, I said it at the end of last year. Um, they, uh, it was clear that they were not going to commit to anybody in until uh, Spencer Petras got his shot at the beginning of 2022, and we've seen the results. We, I don't think we needed to see two whole games. I gave uh, Kirk Ferentz the benefit of the doubt heading into the Iowa State game that he would make a change at quarterback if Spencer struggled. And once again, I was wrong. I wish I wasn't, but I was. So the Nevada game's upcoming. This is Iowa's last chance. I don't know how you possibly defend not making a change. There was a depth chart released Monday. Spencer Peters is still listed number one. That doesn't necessarily mean anything. You got to make that change, folks. Make the change. I don't care if it's Alex Padilla, Joey Labus. Give the fans something to put faith in. And right now, it just can't be Spencer Petras. And it's not good for Spencer Petras. We're throwing the young man, who again, by all accounts, is an excellent human being. We're throwing him to the wolves. It's not fair to the guys who are in practice. Yeah, maybe they're being outperformed by Spencer in practice. As Don Patterson said during the postgame show, 
the games are played on Saturday. So let's see what these guys have. You're not making this change against Michigan. I don't think you're making the change on the road at Rutgers. Make it now against Nevada at home, the most winnable game on the schedule. Coming up, folks, it's myself and Tony Perkins, the Iowa guard who is entering his junior season. An exclusive interview with the Iowa guard, the Iowa basketball season starting in late October, October 31st, the first exhibition, the first game of the year. It's an exhibition contest in Carver. We'll get to Tony Perkins here in a moment, but first, a word from our sponsor. You may have heard of the real-life Hawkeye Man Cave known as Kinnick Under the Kitchen. Well, after lots of hard work, there's not much space left to paint, but the walls are exploding out for public consumption. Under the Kitchen is proud to announce that you can now purchase exclusive prints of some of your favorite Hawkeye legends, including wrestling great Spencer Lee, football players Arlen Bruce, Riley Moss, and Tavian Banks, plus an all-in-one Murray family legacy print featuring Keegan, Chris, and Kenyon Murray himself. Signed and unsigned prints are available, making the perfect collectible or gift for any Hawkeye enthusiast. For more information on purchasing one of these outstanding Hawkeye prints, visit Under the Kitchen on Facebook. That's Under the Kitchen on Facebook. Pleased to be joined now by Iowa shooting guard Tony Perkins, the one and only Tony Perkins from the Indianapolis area, who has established himself as, I think, a future star in Iowa's backcourt, and maybe the maybe not a future star, maybe a star now. Uh, Tony, you've got an opportunity this year. First of all, appreciate you being here, uh, but you've got an opportunity this year with the departure of Keegan to pick up some scoring, um, certainly with the departure of Jordan Bohannon and his ability to make outside shots. First of all, before we get to all that, How's your off-season going? How's the family doing? And uh, how are you enjoying the summer? The off-season uh, is the same as always. Get stronger, get better, get in the gym, stay in the gym. Um, so that's my off-season right there. Uh, my family, good, healthy. Everything's good. fine. Um, this summer, it's been great. Um, got to travel, went to Houston for a little while before coming back to Iowa. And... Um, just really been doing what I like and doing what I love, which is play basketball and lift and just be around what I like to do. How's the team looking? Team looking good. You know, people might say, oh, this and that about us because we don't got Keegan, but we all know what it's going to be and what it's going to come down to. So, What do you think about Keegan right now, what he's doing? I mean, obviously a tremendous summer league, and uh, I think he's got a chance, a pretty good chance to start. Uh, I don't want to speak for the Kings organization. Your thoughts on that surprise you at all to see him not only get drafted top five overall, but to to come out so strong and win MVP for the summer league? Uh, I always knew Keegan would, once he got out of Iowa and went to the Kings, I already knew what it was going to be because I've seen it out and played with him. You know, I didn't, I came in the same class with him. So yeah. I'm really familiar with his game and, like what he like not really what he's going to do but like what he's capable of so it's not really nothing surprising to me what are the biggest areas that you're addressing in the off season is it the outside shot is it um your ability to just dis- distribute i don't know if you're going to see more time at the one this year but what are you focusing on um if you had to sum it all up um i wouldn't really say it's more of me focusing on one area um i've been focused on a lot of areas i've been shooting a lot more from outside, but it's been more of a comp, more of confidence. I'm more of a confidence guy. It's not really uh, out, outside shot I'm missing because I can't shoot or nothing. Just confidence, what's going through my head as the process is going on during games, during practice, you know, them type of situations. But I would say everything's been getting better. I'm shooting, driving, everything's just been coming together. So I've just been working on everything. So. What are what is your outlook for the the backcourt? Because you lose a guy who's been in the program for about eighty years, and Jordan Bohannon. Not to throw him a little zing there, he's been in the program a long time, right? Um, yeah. And he's obviously given Iowa a lot as far as production. Um, you're not Jordan Bohannon. I know you don't aspire to be Jordan Bohannon. You guys are your individual uh, players. But um, what do you think you can do to sort of make up for that void? Because it is a void losing a guy who's been so productive over six years time. Um, to fill that void, um, I could say I can bring in a scoring, defense, rebounding. Um, as you've seen, I've run around the court all game, so I like doing that. Um, 
I can distribute, you know, I just can do whatever, anything. And um, filling that void, um, we also have uh, Aaron Euless here as well. And he he's a junior as well, so he has like, some experience uh, on the court as well. So I think we'll be fine. And on my end, I think I would do good and better than what I did last year, regardless if it was at the beginning of the season, middle of the season, or how I put it at the end. Okay, I want to ask you a specific question. You've got a guy now on staff in Matt Gatons who played the position you play. All right. And <laughs> he's one of the better three point shooters I've seen in an Iowa uniform in my lifetime. Yeah. So has he been able to work with you on your outside shot at all? And regardless, well, I guess well, let's take that first. Have you been able to work with Matt at all as it relates to your, your outside shot? Uh, yes. I worked out with him like three times, I believe. But um, we do like individual workouts. I, Sometimes I go to the wing. Sometimes I go to the point. He usually works with – he's switch on and off, but majority of times I'm either with um, Courtney Eldridge. So I do that. And we do a lot of outside shooting. But overall, um, I don't really do too much one-on-one -on -one, like shooting with coaches. I just get on the gun, shoot my 1,000 thousand shots or 500 shots a day. Or like if we have an off day like today, I'll probably shoot a 1,000. But – like if we have practice and lift, I'll probably come back later tonight and shoot like 500. So I've just been doing that, honestly. And, and is there a – for someone who doesn't who, – who's never been through that process, uh, you're you're working and we're just taking this one piece of your game to start with here, the outside shot. Is there something mechanically that you – like are you trying to get your release off quicker? Um, is there something with your footwork? I mean, is there something specifically that, that fans – uh, will maybe notice it looks a little different with that outside shot that makes it a bit more efficient? I wouldn't say how the quicker release, how I release it, because I was told, like, my release is pretty accurate to get it off or whatnot. And uh, mainly I've really been just focusing on my balance, like get my feet straight, um, lining my feet up, um, just mainly staying on balance and mainly being able to shoot on balance. So if I make, like, a move, or something, I'm a little off balance. I know, like, to put my feet this area and be able to get a better shot instead of fading away when I could just stand still and just shoot it and just come right down instead of fading back, if that makes sense. This is the first conversation you and I have ever had. I've, co of course, talked with your uncle, Frank Henderson, on a number of occasions. Um, but uh, you'll see when talking to me, Tony, I like to jump all the way around. I like to jump everywhere. So this is going to be kind of a, a crazy few minutes. But uh, better dunker, you or Amarian Nimmers? Because I heard that you actually voted Nimmers which I thought was uh, – I was kind of disappointed that – where's the confidence, man? Is he that good? Um, he got a few – he got a few tricks. He, okay, I, I'm going to say this. He has a few tricks that I can't – well, I, I wouldn't say I can't do. I just never tried it. So. What? So what are the tricks? Uh, he, what I've seen is a 360 between the legs and a 360 windmill. But right. I never tried it, so I can't say I can't do it. But um, I can get up there, but I just never tried it. Um, but he he can't do some certain stuff I can do. So it's All right. I don't know where it's really at, but we'll figure it out one day. So tell so tell us about Nimmers because uh a lot of us haven't really gotten much of a glimpse into his game. He's coming here as a walk on. I know he had opportunities to be on scholarship other places, but he wanted to earn one here. What uh, what have you seen from him besides the athleticism and his ability to to flush it? What have you seen from him as a as a guard that you think can help Iowa? Uh, he's pretty good. Um, you know, he's a freshman. You know, he don't, re he don't really know as much. But um, me being a guard and me being a vet veteran now, it's like um, i just been really helpful helping him out. So he's coming along. He's going to he most definitely going to be good. He can shoot. He can dribble. He's explosive, of course. And that's when you were guarding an explosive guy, it's hard to guard, especially when he can shoot mid-range threes or whatnot. Um, and on de on defense, he's athletic, so if you get to the room, he can explode right up and block it. Or he has quick lateral quickness, so he's going to most definitely be good. And uh, we'd be remiss if we didn't bring up the departure of Joe Toussaint. Talk about explosiveness, and that's another guy that uh, you guys are going to be replacing in the backcourt. Um, if you had to name one guy uh, that, that has, you know, you obviously got you've gotten to look at some of the freshmen. I know Josh Dix is still working his way back from that leg injury, but one guy either with the freshmen or guys who are returning that you think could be a sleeper star, maybe it's more than one guy. Who would you say? Um, honestly, um, we didn't seen everybody play. We didn't seen Patrick play, Chris, Payton. Um, 
Connor, me, you know, a lot of everybody who played last year. Um, freshmen, I would say all three of them are sleeping stars, of course. But if I was to pick just one, I would probably have to go with – I would go with Josh. Either Josh – I would go with either Josh or Aaron. Well, I like it. And uh, you bring up Aaron Eulis, and, of course, it was Aaron, if I'm not mistaken, not looking back, Aaron, you, Josh, Agundale, uh, and then the two Murray twins. And that class – there was you're you're not oblivious to this. There was some criticism of that class and and perception from the outside world that Fran didn't do very well in this class. And all of a sudden, you got Keegan Murray, who's a top five pick. Um, you're an emerging star. His brother decided to come back, and and I think many perceive him to be a, a future first round pick. Did that? Did the perception from the outside world motivate you guys as members of that class to kind of prove people wrong? Um, honestly. I don't really be too tuned in to what other people say. Like, you know, you guys got them fans, but fans are just going to be fans. They're going to say what they want to say. But I guarantee any fan who was talking or had their any type of criticism towards what class brought in, they couldn't beat us 505 either. Even if it was our freshman year or now, like, that's why we don't even look at it. We just be like, okay. Like, when people be like, like last year, I was like, oh, Lucas, Luca left. Weez kept left, CJ left, you know, everybody left, blah, blah. It's not that, oh, we're going to be bottom of the Big Ten. We're not going to do anything. So it's just like you can say what you want. You can think what you want to think about us. But at the end of the day, when we win, you're going to want to jump on our side and be like, oh, how great is Iowa? Is it almost better? Like, Tony, I'd rather, as an Iowa guy, and I was born and raised an Iowa fan, isn't it better when people don't expect you to do anything? Because, I mean, is, is there is such a thing as pressure, right? That's not an imaginary concept. There is such a thing as expectations and pressure, and I think that can work against you at times. Am I correct? Um, Yeah, but it's not really – I don't really take it as pressure, nor do I take it as they're expecting this out of us because I don't really look at the fans like, oh, we have to impress them. Sure, sure. We have to impress them. I don't really play like that. It's just like, okay, you're here. I appreciate the support. Thank you for supporting me. Thank you for supporting the Hawkeyes. But at the end of the day, I'm trying to – I'm here to do this for my team, do this for me, you know, get a win. And that's pretty much just that. I'm not really a big what fans got to say guy, if that makes sense. No, makes total sense. And um, this is a question that kind of broadened the, the uh, questioning here for a moment. Uh, state of college athletics. I've had conversations with, with uh, coaches, former coaches, uh, former players, but it seems like the, the one – group of people that we don't talk to enough about the state of college athletics and specifically NIL and the transfer portal are you, you know, you as a, st a student athlete and your teammates, what are your thoughts? Obviously the student athlete has gained a lot more um, freedom and certainly with NIL, the ability to uh, uh, profit off one's name, image and likeness, which I think is great, but certainly the, the, the scale, the beam scale has turned as, has begun to go in the opposite direction. There's, you know, some people would say it's a little bit over the top right now and that needs to be regulated. Just your thoughts in general on the state of college athletics being in the um, middle of your your college campaign. Um, honestly, um, it's just to on the NIL situation. Uh, it just comes down to who's who's throwing the most money towards the players. But to me, as I always look like now, it's like they looking into like, OK, we can get paid now. So let's go to the school who's giving us most money. But. Even if I was in today's society where you can get paid, I've never been a player who's like, oh, I want to go where the money go. I mean, money's nice. You know, I love money, but that's not the that's not the ultimate goal. The ultimate goal is to make it to the NBA. So that will continue to be my goal, regardless of what come in or what gets thrown at me. But um, as far as that, that's pretty much it for the NIL. And um, I feel like, it's going to change the game of college basketball a lot, um, mainly because you have your you have your certain amount of people who want to go to Duke, Kentucky, but now schools can throw in this amount of money and then they would go there. Then it's like, oh, they we know they paid them or whatever the case is. Right. But, um, I wouldn't say it's not a bad thing because you deserve to get paid for um, your likeness, your image, and all that. So I mean. I don't just I don't just I don't say anything about it because sure. I mean if I, me being a player I'm like dang I'm doing all this and I ain't getting nothing I'm just playing just to make it to the NBA or to showcase my game to the world but 
once they get to okay now i can make money okay now now it's making sense okay now i'm getting the rights and the freedom that i want and deserve for playing for iowa i guess yeah no that's a great answer and uh you have a former rival high school rival his name i don't know if anybody's heard of him his name's nigel pack who uh got a little bit of money to leave his school this yeah. year. I mean, that, that that's pretty much out in the open, Tony. Just your look. I mean, I don't know if you're friends with Nigel, but you you know all about what happened there with with his departure to Kansas State. And Nigel Pack's a great player. I'm not going to take anything away from him. But what were your what was your reaction when you saw the the dollar figures that were reported surrounding his transfer to Miami? Um, honestly, once I saw that, I was just had the eye over the like, shoot, that's that's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. Yeah. Are you staying in touch with Nigel? Uh, me and him never really talk like that. We just play okay. against each other. Like, growing up, we played with each other for, like, maybe two, three years. And then after that, I'll play somewhere else. He played somewhere else. And then just fade away after that. If anybody who's watching this interview has not looked it up, go on YouTube and look up. I think you just look up Tony Perkins versus Nigel Pack, right? Uh, yeah. Like, you guys had some showdowns. And, uh, yeah, he's he's uh, you and him are both carving out tremendous roles at the Power 5 level. I do want to kind of finish off this discussion, Tony, talking about what fans can expect from you specifically. We've talked about some of the sleeper picks on the team, and we've talked about your outside shot and you know the, the desire to, to uh, get more explosive across the board. You've got opportunities, as we alluded to earlier, to take on more of the load of the offense. Certainly, your I think your ability to defend got you on the court early. Um and it's something that Iowa continues to need is, is guys who can be stoppers in the backcourt. But what, what will Tony Perkins version 2022 look like? Um, you kind of saw a little, a little version of what I will be, what I, what it's like this, what it's like, what it's going to be like this year. Uh, once we played Nebraska, I was able to knock down outside shots, comfortable was confidence. And this shot has been mostly focused on confidence and the mind games and just, you know, just focusing on, okay, it's the game, play my game, don't worry about this, don't worry about that, you know. So just staying focused. Um, defense, you know, that's going to be the same. You know, I love guarding the best player, stopping the best player. I am always did. I always like doing that. Um, you'll see more rebounding from me defensively, offensively. Um, probably more blocks. I've been getting a lot of blocks this year in practice, so. But you're long, man. That's one thing I've observed. Your uncle and my t- you you have long. I don't know what what is your wingspan. Do you know? Not sure off the bat, but it's like seven something. Like it's over seven. seven it is yes. over seven foot. Yeah. You got long yeah. arms, man. I mean, yeah. I, I, I that's one thing. I've, and so that's got to help you defensively, right? Yeah. Um. That as well. Um. I've been in a weight room, getting stronger. So, you know, use getting to the rim, of course. Um. Uh, lost, lost how many pounds? Lost ten pounds. So I'm like one ninety six, one ninety seven. So I'm at the I'm at the range to where I was in high school. So I'm getting my little feel back, um, get my body back, get my movement back, get my quickness back. You know, um, outside shot is way better. Um, Mid range. So basically, just. Man, I can't really say what you're going to see. I just want the fans to see what they're going to see, and this is going to be that. Uh, I, I thought you were actually – you have a really good a three-point shot off the dribble. I'm assuming you're working on your three-point shot off the catch. Yeah, I've been uh, doing it all. Dribble, one dribble pull-ups, um, come off the ball screen, shooting behind the ball screen. Um, just doing a lot of different things off of – off the dribble, catch and shoot. Um, just mainly get my balance right. Um, and that's pretty much it. Just been because I can get to the room whenever, shoot floaters, whatever, yeah. whatever the case is. But it was just more of my consistency and my um, confidence. Once again, that's that's a big major part of my game is my confidence. All right, I want to ask you, uh, Tony, about the future. And obviously, you're focused on this season, which I, you know, I'm not asking you to take your focus away from it, but. Um, obviously I think most college basketball players would say their, their ultimate goal is to get to the NBA or to play professionally somewhere. If the NBA is not an option, I went on the record last year and said, I, 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 now you don't have to agree with this, but this is just my assessment. I, I think you, you know, might have an opportunity down the road to play professionally as a one. 
Um, do you, how much do you run at the one? Is that even in your mindset? Are you, a, you view yourself as a true two? I know coach McCaffrey likes to slide you guys around and, and, you know, be versatile. But to me with your size, I'm thinking of your size and length and quickness and explosiveness. Maybe you're a one at the next level. What are your thoughts? Um, honestly, I don't really, I don't really go off position wise. I mean, of course, you know, next level is position wise. But if it comes down to me needing to play the one, then I'm willing to. Like you've seen, I've played the like when we was at a Big Ten tournament, I played the one majority of the games, um, and I did fine there. So I mean, it don't really bother me. I'm just I'm just a player. Like if I got to guard a five man, like if I needed to guard Zach Eady or uh, Kofi, I, I would do it. Like I'm just a player who doesn't really care where I'm at on the floor. Because if I'm on the floor, I'm going to produce either if I'm at the one, the two, the three, the four, the five. Like, it doesn't really matter. Like, last year, I've guarded – last year in practice, I would guard Keegan. This year, when we play open gym or any type of basketball, anything, and me and Chris are on different teams, I would guard Chris. Um, I would guard Patrick. Like, I don't really care that much. Like, I'm just on the floor just to do whatever. If you need me to – Go out there, run a one, I'd do it. You need me to go out there, run a two, I'd do it. So it's not really anything for me. How are the big guys looking? Oh, uh, good. Fill up, stretch this game out, jumper. Look, jumper, shooting well, um, like you've seen at South Dakota. I believe North Dakota. North Dakota. Yep. North Dakota. Um, Riley, he's got way better. Um, been a great rim protector this summer. Um, been, dunking a lot, been dunking everything, honestly. Um, Josh very got very mobile, lost weight, uh, quickness, um, using his body, of course, um, rebounding, blocking shots. Um, all bigs have been at their top. Well, I wouldn't say at their top level, but on the urge to get into their top level or um, getting themselves up to where they want to be at this level right now. Final question, Tony, and I appreciate you letting me jump all over the place. No, you're fine. You're fine. Uh, final question. Um, there is still, despite the fact that Fran McCaffrey has been the head coach at the University of Iowa for well over a decade now, uh, there are still the critics that uh, view Fran as what they view Fran as. They think he's got a wild temper and he's just kind of uh, flies off the cuff. I, I don't view him that way at all. I know, I'm sure, you don't view him that way every player that I've ever spoken with has said nothing but good things. Tell me about Fran McCaffrey, the coach and about, and Fran McCaffrey, the person, what is your relationship like with your head coach? Um, close. Um, we get into like film rooms. We laugh, we joke, you know, we make comments, but when it's time to get the business, we get straight to it. It's nothing, per, it's nothing, out of, nothing out of order. Um, but when it, when it's not business, we joke, everybody, all the players, even him and the other coaches, um, we have great times and we go on visits. We joke with the recruit. We talk, we connect with them. We just have great times with them. Um, he's, he's a good guy. He's a great coach, great person. Um, great father, of course. Um, that's pretty much it on him. Um, when, when it comes to coaching, he's fine. I mean, just cause you see him arguing or, Getting mad at the refs. I mean, if I was a coach, you was a coach, you would do the same thing. Especially the fans, they go even wilder in the in the stands. Oh yeah, their own call. So you can't really view them as an angry person when we all probably would do the same thing. Especially if the game is not going the right way. Just my opinion, Tony. I thought some of the officiating, uh, a in the Richmond game, was some of the worst officiating I've seen. And if, and and your head coach held it together. People don't give him credit when he holds it together. Because I, I think officiating, that's just my opinion. Uh, I think it's gotten worse, at least as last year. I don't remember it being some of these games, Rutgers game. I, and, you know, Piscataway was, I, you know, I don't, really can't. I, we've talked about that at length. So I, I think people sometimes are a bit too hard on your head coach. And that R Richmond game, I, I, mean, I heard Connor uh, on a radio show in Eastern Iowa a month or two ago <laughs> talking about how it still bothers him. And yeah. he doesn't – I mean, he, he – it sounded to me like, yeah, you're going to always treasure that Big Ten championship game. But that Richmond game is going to haunt you until you can get back on the court. Is that true with you, or have you kind of flushed it? Um, it doesn't really haunt me, um, mainly because I'm a I'm more of a person who's like, okay, we went we went to the tournament this year, this year, okay, we didn't we got past first round. 
my freshman year. We lost first round. But now um, I have a bigger role, and um, I like to win, so I would do my best to make it farther so we don't have to think about, oh, we won a Big Ten tournament my sophomore year, but we lost. But now it's, okay, we won in my junior year, and we went farther in my junior year. So I don't, I don't really hunt. Like, if we lose, okay, flush it, next game. Like, when we lost, okay, ready to get off season. Let's get this work in. Let's come back better next year. Let's go farther. That's just mainly what it is. Appreciate the time, Tony. It's been a pleasure to catch up with you and uh, glad to know you and your family are doing well. And, and the team is certainly uh, going to be locked and ready to go and, and make up for, um, you know, I know Connor's got some unpaid dues to, to uh, take care of. And uh, I know you guys are excited about the non-conference schedule with Duke and Georgia Tech and Clemson going down to Florida and to play in the the uh, uh, two-day tournament. So look forward to the season. Appreciate you taking the time, and uh, hopefully we get a chance to talk with you soon. All right, thank you. Tony Perkins, great personality. He is a great representative for Iowa basketball, and he's got an opportunity with his athleticism. You get that three-point shot down, <laughs> that is a dangerous, dangerous man on the perimeter in the Big Ten Conference. And I, I really do. I've said this last year. I, I know people don't think he's a natural point guard. I, I think if he, his ball handling can improve just a little bit with his size and athleticism, an ability to get in the lane and finish, I think he could play in the league. Uh, and I know that's jumping the gun a bit. He's got some some improvement to make. We're going to find out what improvement he's made here in about a month and a half. I can't believe basketball season's around the corner. So regardless of what happens with football, we've got Iowa basketball to fall back on. Chris Murray, Tony Perkins, we'll see what the big men do. Patrick McCaffrey, should be a fun year, folks. It's going to be some fun basketball in Carver Hawkeye Arena this year. And of course, we'll be here all season talking about it right here from the Hawkeye of the Storm. Appreciate you tuning in for another episode of Brad is Branded Thoughts. Please subscribe to the channel. Follow us on Twitter, at From the Hawkeye on Twitter. Again, that's at From the Hawkeye on Twitter. You can also like our page on Facebook, From the Hawkeye of the Storm on Facebook. And we will be with you soon right here from the Hawkeye of the Storm.